Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for being here today. I'm Council Member Steve Levin, Chair of the Council's Committee on General Welfare, and I want to thank everybody for coming out to today's important hearing. I want to thank my colleagues for being here, Council Member Annabelle Palm of the Bronx, Council Member Fernando Cabrera of the Bronx, Council Member Ben Kalos of Manhattan, Council Member Barry Grudenchik of Queens, and um, we're expecting more committee members and bill sponsors to be here throughout the course of the hearing. Um, I also want to welcome Commissioner Banks and his team uh, for being here. Today, our goal is to focus on how families with children move through the Department of Homeless Services system. As the hearing title implies, from path to permanency, this committee is interested in hearing more about how families interact with the system from the moment they enter PATH to apply for shelter to moving out of shelter and into permanent housing. In addition to today's, to today's oversight topic, the committee is also going to be considering six pieces of legislation which aim to improve areas where low income and homeless families contact the city system, including public assistance applications and rental subsidy vouchers. Proposed intro uh, 855A, which is sponsored by Councilmember Ben Kalos, and I'll ask him to say a few words in a moment in relation to notification of public assistance. Intro number 1461, sponsored by myself, in relation to requiring the Department of Social Services to provide customer service training twice per year to all em employees that interact with members of the public. Intro set 1577, sponsored by myself as well, in relation to establishing an office of case management. Intro 1597, also sponsored by myself in relation to requiring that the Department of Homeless Services recognize time spent in foster care as homelessness for the purposes of meeting mental voucher eligibility requirements. And intro, excuse me, two more. Intro uh, 1635, sponsored by Council Member Johnson in relation to, uh, to HRA job centers. And intro 1642, also sponsored by myself in relation to uh, extending uh, the rental assistance vouchers uh, that are time limited into a permanent uh, application. Uh, I'm very gratified to be conducting this hearing today. Since last September, I have been working with a constituent and her daughter who have been going through the family homelessness process. From losing her home, to sleeping in her car, to going to PATH, to going to temporary shelter in a hotel. Instructions. Automatic pre-filled applications and renewals using information from previous applications to pre-fill other program applications for which they are likely to qualify. Assistance completing application over the phone, through 311, online or even in person, and then annual goals and planning by Department of Social Services to enroll all individuals eligible for public assistance with reporting on the number of individuals enrolled, offered assistance with breakdowns by program type. Through this legislation, <clears throat> New York City can create a no wrong door approach and provide a seamless experience for residents so they receive increasing amounts of government service through minimal interaction with government bureaucracy. About half a year ago, I had the privilege of working with GovLab, Robin Hood Foundation, Stewards of Change to collaborate on a memo. Uh, at the time, we couldn't tell anyone who it was for, but at this point, with the change in administration, it was actually working with the White House, laying out that the framework for this had already been laid out and that states can take advantage of existing funding to build these systems. In 2015, software giant Intuit launched Benefit Assist, offering 30 million Americans who file taxes with TurboTax an opportunity to determine if they are eligible for government benefits such as SNAP. 2016, Benefit Assist was expanded to include Federal Communications Commission's Lifeline program, which offers discounts on phone service, and once upon a time, it was going to offer discounts on broadband service. I believe in universal broadband. This administration, the federal level, does not. Uh, amazingly, though, Intuit actually released the source code for this so any government can use it, adapt it, and get residents the assistance they qualify for as free and open source software that anyone can use. I want to thank uh, almost a dozen folks who are in the audience today uh, and groups uh, that are here to testify. If you haven't already, there are these uh, witness slips that the council will just hold up for a moment, and you can get that from the sergeant at arms. Please make sure to complete it. Uh, I also want to thank uh, former controller Liz Holtzman, 1199 SCIU, Jacob Solomon from Code for America, Daniel Beebe from Benefits Kitchen, and others who are submitting testimony electronically. Uh, and again, I want to thank the chair for his determination to hear this bill uh, after the initial postponement, which was for very good reason. 
Uh, and uh, congratulations on uh, the birth of his child and for taking paternity leave, which more men should be doing. Uh, and I'm glad that we we're able to get it onto today's calendar. I want to thank the advocates who are here to testify and who have been fighting for this for much longer than I've been in office. And of course, Commissioner Banks for his great work and his openness to new ideas and his support for what we're trying to achieve here. Look forward to today's hearing and getting this done as quickly as possible. Responding to the introductions. In each instance regarding the package of bills before the committee today, we look forward to working with the sponsors to address concerns that underlie the proposed legislation. Intro 855A. The bill would require the Human Resources Administration to determine if public assistance recipients may qualify for additional forms of public assistance. When HRA determines that an individual may qualify for other benefits, the bill would require HRA to notify those individuals that they may qualify for additional forms of public assistance and send those individuals applications with instructions to, uh, as to how to apply for that assistance. The bill would also require HRA to pre-fill the application with any information HRA already has from the recipient's original application. HRA has undergone significant modernization efforts since 2014 with respect to benefits access. To improve access to benefits and information on a pending or active case, we developed an online portal available to New Yorkers anywhere an internet uh, connection is available. Access HRA is an innovative tool that allows New York City residents to re retrieve benefit information and apply and recertify for SNAP and other benefits. This portal allows clients to create an Access HRA account to gain access to over 100 case-specific points of information in real time, including application and case statuses, upcoming appointments, benefits account balances, and documents requested for eligibility determinations. Additionally, clients can make changes to contact information, view eligibility notices electronically, and opt into text messaging and email alerts. Clients can also request budget letters online. We continue to improve this tool to add new functionality and will soon allow recipients to submit their required periodic report in addition to reporting changes in circumstances. As of May 31, 2017, there are more than 300,000 HRA online accounts for SNAP households, and we receive over 33,000 submissions each month. However, HRA's ability to utilize these approaches is the result of multiple federal and state waivers in response to complex federal and state regulations. As the city is focused on the reauthorization of the federal farm bill, including recently testifying before a House subcommittee on our technology innovations to expand access to benefits and promote program efficiencies, we are continuing to monitor the status of provisions of federal law that enable us to obtain the waivers so that we can continue to receive them. Given the continuing developments in Washington that can, can uh, impact our benefits and services, we look forward to discussing uh, with Councilmember Kalos and the committee uh, steps that we can take to address the concerns that gave rise to this proposed legislation at this uncertain time. We also want to make sure the proposed legislation takes into account the greater reliance we're placing on online transactions rather than paper transactions. Uh, automatic benefits legislation, which is why I'm here today. I, I like the great work you're doing on access. HRA, in your testimony, you state, quote, make sure the proposed legislation takes into account the great reliance we are placing on online transactions rather than paper transactions, unquote. The prior version of the bill included two sections, an F section and a G section. F said uh, it created a mandate that unless federal laws or state laws prohibited you, that all the applications actually had to be accepted electronically or by facsimile. Is that a provision you'd support putting back into a future version of the bill? I think the challenge that we have with any of this right now mm -hmm. is that all the things that we're doing through Access NYC are subject to federal waivers. And so our major focus right now is on making sure that the reauthorization of the Farm Bill in the Congress doesn't impede our ability to continue to do what we're doing now. I recognize the value of, the, of doing more than what we're doing now, mm -hmm. uh, but our, our first priority is to make sure that we continue to have the ability to do what we're doing now. I'm going to do touch now. on that in a second. Sure. I think along the same lines, another section that was in the original version of the bill but came out but we could perhaps put back in if you'd support it is just creating the, the universal application system for online. And I guess along that same question, what I had thought of is, as you know, I'm a free and open source so software developer. Mm -hmm. uh, so whether or not you would support having a, a goal in the legislation for a, a simplified, single, unified benefits application system, which appears you're trying to build at Access HRA. Uh, we're certainly trying to build that. There are external constraints, I think, as you know, and you've been very helpful in trying to address some of, uh, some of them, which is one constraint is the 
you know, the Medicaid and, and, uh, and food stamp or SNAP application process is separate. This is something we're working on the state with in order to have it be uh, more, uh, uh, more in line with I, I know what you would like to, to see and I would like to see happen. Uh, with re so, so I, I guess just hoping with our committee council that we could restore those two pieces. Along the same lines, and, and so this is interesting uh, as, as I as the younger person, so I'm really concerned about the digital divide, which is why there is a mandate for printed and paper applications because I'm concerned about leaving anyone behind and keeping my feet on the ground in the physical world. So I guess to the extent you have any specific language to ensure that we offer things online, but we still continue to provide things to, for folks offline, uh, because I believe there is a strong nexus between income and poverty levels and access to uh, internet and these types of apps. Right, I would say 70% of, of our clients are using smartphones now, and mm -hmm. that's why we've seen once we created a, uh, an application in which clients could submit documents to us off of the smartphone and not have to come to our office, mm -hmm. uh, and people could submit applications and, or recertifications online. We've seen that you know 70 plus percent of of applications coming to us online. When uh, did the uh, Access HRA app launch? Uh, just a couple months ago. Okay. So it's pretty it's pretty fresh, but you look at the number of accounts we have, which is pretty mm -hmm. pretty significant. I'm seeing five to ten thousand uh, downloads on the Android App Store, uh, and so quick thing, just for your staff to know, your your link is broken right now. So nyc.gov slash access HRA is not working and neither is uh, nyc.gov slash access HRA app. So the good news is your website is still online, but the vanity URL is not. Uh, so if you can bring that up to do it, and you are not the first agency who I have checked whether or not the link worked and found it didn't, so please do not feel particularly offense. Uh, I won't actually, the meeting that I have after this hearing ends is with the MIS director. <laughs> Just coincidentally, so I appreciate you raising it. No, no worries. Uh, I guess along the fact, so you've built this great new app. Is it possible to release that as free and open source and, and perhaps have an API? Because we have a lot of folks who are in this space who want to help get people into that system. Right. I think what we found when we looked at this the last time, there were some great, excited people out in the world that wanted to do this. Mm -hmm. But then they created applications that didn't actually track the federal requirements. And so we started to get lots of applications from clients that didn't meet any requirements. Would you open up your rules engine to those folks so that they can use your rules instead of trying to figure it out for themselves? Because we're going to hear from like three or four of them who are trying to do their best. But uh, if you release your rule set, they can just use yours instead of figuring it out on their own. I mean, I'm sure there's a discussion we had here. But the yeah. risk here is that um, a a change in the way people submit things to us. I just remember this very vividly uh, that we received uh, a, a, a significant number of applications that were improperly submitted. They started a federal uh, time bar for us to have to process them, but we didn't have any information or sufficient information to process them, and it created a huge work strain on our staff to check. To reach I, I think there's an opportunity to work with folks for it to be a, a better process, and the best way to do it is if you give them your rule set, then they're not using their own rules, they're using yours. Yeah. Uh, F fair point. I'm going to urge that we don't do anything till the farm bill is reauthorized, because I think that might affect I have a resolution <laughs> in order to <laughs> su support that reauthorization. Uh, and so I guess one key thing I noticed on Access HRA, you have online applications for SNAP, for cash assistance, emergency cash assistance, uh, often referred to as the one-shot deal, child care in lieu of cash assistance, and Medicaid renewal, which is a pre-populated form but not actually online. So it looks like you got the technology questions are whether or not we can start adding things like Early Learn, Head Start, UPK, Compass NYC. On the housing side, we've got SCREE and DRE, Senior Citizen and Disabled Rent Increase Exemption, which are actually city programs. Uh, and whether it's housed at Access HRA or Access NYC or a different piece, just getting all of those together on one centralized tool. I mean, that's certainly a conversation to have. As you can see, what we've done is anything that we actually administer directly, mm -hmm. we've created a uniformed combined tool for it. If, if we can move Scree and Dree and all the, if we can just 
is there a working group between the different agencies that administer human service uh, benefits? A access. Uh, there's certainly a, a, a significant focus on how to how to uh, address access. Meanwhile, where we can, we're building other other functionality with rental assistance. Uh, renewals and so forth to make sure that anything we can do that we directly are operating, we can make accessible online sure. in, the way, in the way that I, I know you would want us to and that we want to ourselves. One set of programs, so we people ask me for two things. They ask me for affordable housing and they ask me for a job. Uh, <laughs> I tell them that I'm, I'm a reformer, so I don't have those patronage jobs to appoint, uh, but uh, they, they don't seem to be happy about that. Uh, but we do have some great jobs that are available through the city, whether it's through civil service, but also youth jobs through summer youth employment, in-school youth, out-of-school youth, youth adult internship program, work, learn, grow, and employment program. If those could be integrated into the system along with uh, using the data you have at HRA, uh, Access HRA to connect it with Housing Connect so that folks can just have everything in one place. And I think both of those sets of tools are actually missing from Access NYC. I mean, for our for HRA clients, uh, which are DHS clients as well, who are participating in our work programs, we have internal processes in which we are connecting those clients to jobs. Uh, so I think, you know, we, we've eliminated a WEP. So no more WEP, no more WEP program, and we implemented new, uh, new employment contracts this past April, uh, Career Pathway, Career Advance, and Youth, uh, uh, pathway and through that system we're connecting our own clients to jobs we also have text to work uh, which we think is we uh, we urge our clients to participate in uh, our texting service in which we advise clients directly of available jobs so for our own client clients we have systems to be advising them of jobs if your constituents are our clients we should um, make sure that you're aware of uh, all the methodologies we have for our clients to get jobs if they're not our clients I would love to, to help them too, but my first priority is helping the clients that are on our caseload. Fair, I, I think this program is about just helping every single New Yorker get Fair every enough. benefit that they need. Uh, and so you touched on in, in your responses and also in your testimony, quote, multiple federal and state waivers in response to complex federal and state regulations. I appreciate some of the conversations we've been able to have. Some of the panelists that will be coming after you are incredibly grateful because they help facilitate some conversations at the highest level of government. Coming out of that conversation, uh, I collaborated with GovLab, Robin Hood Foundation, Stewards of Change. We put together a legal memo that addressed some of the concerns and even made recommendations for uh, the highest levels of government. And I think one of the things that I keep coming to is that I'm, I'm not seeing federal and state regulations that prevent some of the thing, prevent this legislation from being enacted. I have guidance from the President of the United States, Barack Obama, in Executive Order 13563. I have guidance from the Administration for Children and Families at the Department of Health and Human Services with a report that details every section of law and every regulation that permits it. And many states that do not complain to be as progressive as New York City do far more than we do in New York. Uh, there, there are states where senior citizens just get an EBT card in the mail pre-filled. They don't even have to apply. They just get it just like a lot of senior citizens get Medicare. And I think it's one third of the states that have that. Uh, so I guess one question is just, we, we got this memo. If you could review it and commit to respond with specific concerns on any specific laws, regulations, or case law on point, or let's move forward. Right, R remember, I know, that, and I know you were very helpful with this and involved with it, that our provision of benefits is provided through state systems. And I think you, you are correct to identify um, different states do different things. And uh, I think it's one of the promising initiatives that we have, uh, the joint effort with uh, uh, local department of social services, including New York City, uh, with State Office of Temporary Assistance and Disability Assistance, to look for ways to uh, consolidate the state systems and take advantage of potential federal money to do that so that we can do some of the things that you would like us to do. But uh, and as you know, we, we have to provide benefits through the state WMS system, and we have to provide uh, health care through the 
uh, state uh, a state of health system, and there are very good conversations going on between the city and state about how to do many of the things that you're asking us to do. Where where is the state on integrated eligibility system IES? They're they're continuing to to move forward with the various uh, components of it. How long have we been continuing to move forward on? Have we put it out for RFP and procurement yet? I believe that they are close. They've either just done that or close to doing it. I don't have the latest on, on it, but I'd be happy to tell you where, where they are. If it was us, it's I could tell you where we are, but I, I need to check on where they it's are. It's been three years, five months, 26 days, and uh, 15 hours, 24 minutes, and uh, 55 seconds. And I wait with bated breath, but if I was holding my breath, I wouldn't be here anymore. I just have to note for the record that you're not talking about a city agency. <laughs> I, I, I understand, but if they're not going to do it, maybe as part of our own upgrades to WMS, and if we release it as free and open source, they can just take that code and uh, implement it too without actually additional cost. Uh, again, you, you know we've made substantial yes. changes in access and we're and we're interested in making more of them but like with some of the rental assistance bills that are here we uh, do things in the context of state approvals uh, for different things I look forward to working with you and hope to hear from some of our experts that we have here today Great. I know our chair has more questions Beth Novick uh, Rob, Rod uh, Rob Roderick Rob Roderick Andre Monnier and John Robertson. You can go ahead. Thank you. Is this on? Great. Thank you very much. I am really uh, delighted and honored to be here today to speak in support of 855A, the process for apl of applying for assistance. Uh, my name, as was already announced, is Professor Beth Simone Novak. I am both a professor at NYU and the head of its governance lab, and I also was formerly the deputy CTO of the United States and head of open government under President Obama. So I wanted to come out today to say that if this bill is enacted, it has the potential to begin to help New Yorkers. It's a first step in the direction of helping those most in need of public assistance to receive the benefits for which they are eligible and thus improve their standard of living and help to begin to lift people out of poverty or near poverty and at the same time decrease administrative burden on the cost uh, administrative burden and cost on the city. So I only have a few minutes today to speak to you, so thus what I've done is I've prepared and hopefully entered into the record a memorandum dated December 17, 2017, uh, that I collaborated uh, in drafting along with a short article that I published in Governing Magazine also around the same time. Both lay out in detail the case for and the argument in favor of so-called automatic benefits, or these efforts to use new technology to simplify the delivery of benefits by reducing and simplifying benefit collection. So both of them explain how through cutting red tape we could create more efficient, more data-driven, and more humane government. So I want to introduce them into the record to also show that the bill that's before you today, as you know, was introduced more than two years ago and has been intentionally delayed in order to develop a practical and incremental strategy for implementation, the one that you see before you today. The bill is very important because it's estimated, as you know better than I, that 1.7 million New Yorkers are receiving SNAP benefits, but that number represents only 72.5 percent of those who are eligible. That means that at least 600,000 New Yorkers are eligible to receive SNAP benefits who aren't already doing so, and beyond that, of course, countless other benefits to which people don't even know they are entitled and which they are not accessing. The reason is, I think, that we need to reduce the burden that people face and the stigma that they face involved in obtaining benefits. 
So re by requiring the use of data that government is already collecting, we can simplify the process of determining if public assistant recipients actually qualify for additional forms of public assistance at the time that they apply for one benefit, and pre-filling those forms using information, again, already provided. The bill takes in this way an important first step through, through to reimagining how government thinks about and administers public assistance programs. So if the bill goes forward from committee and for beyond, then New York would be taking a step really to catch up with other states. This was already mentioned earlier today, and I won't go into the detail that's laid out in uh, further in writing in the testimony. But in fact, we're doing, we would be doing that which Louisiana already does, that which South Carolina already does, that which California already does in enabling automatic, if you will, pre-filling of forms, automatic renewal of benefits, and simplification of the process. Application, applications for SNAP, for Medicaid, is that my timing? Is that what that means? Oh, I didn't know how formal the two minutes was, so let me just end on that and turn it over to my colleagues then and submit this into the record and simply end by saying that I think this is a very important first step in making it easier for people to obtain their benefits and a step that I hope you will take. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, we, it's two minutes and 30 seconds, we, so that's for everyone's Edification. Edification. I, I stand duly edified, and uh, <laughs> I will leave you the other five and a half minutes worth of reading to do on your own then. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I'll wait, the, I'll wait the few more minutes and to hear my colleagues. Uh, <clears throat> hello. Sorry. <clears throat> my name is uh, Robert Roderick. Um, I'm a product leader uh, at Intuit. We're the parent company of TurboTax, QuickBooks, and Mint.com. Um, <clears throat> two years ago, we set out uh, to build a new product called Benefit Assist, where we would take your tax data and automatically overlay it onto government assistance forms. But we would also do an important key step, which was helping users to identify that they, were el or they may be eligible for these benefits. So it was something that we designed that would be free for consumers and free for government agencies. <clears throat> one of the things that we found in our research was the number one reasons people in TurboTax didn't apply for these benefits was they didn't know they, they qualified. They were paying taxes, they had a job, they didn't realize they, were, they may be eligible for the benefits. The second reason is they didn't know where to go apply or how to apply. The third main reason is the application was too difficult and time consuming. There are questions that I myself could not even um, uh, understand. And with TurboTax, we did a very good job of taking very complicated documents and simplifying them to make it easier to answer. <clears throat> In 2015, we had one million, over one million U.S. taxpayers use our benefit assist tool across all 50 states. <clears throat> We also added uh, software tools such as taking a picture of your paycheck to make verification of income um, easier on state agencies. Um, in total, <clears throat> we actually facilitated over 1.5 billion in user benefits across this, um, all 50 states. And that was over a three month time period, basically tax season. Um, with the rollout of the tool, we decided that it was a better fit to be in government agencies' hands. So we, um, with working with Ben Kalos, we were able to open source the software and gift it um, <clears throat> to the government. And we're also into it as uh, it stands by wanting to help any government agencies that want to integrate into the tool um, for, for future use. Um, one thing I would note is one of the biggest things that we felt for agencies is having when um, updates to uh, rules or compliance comes out, it takes us uh, months for them to update their systems. We've built a configuration that in 30 seconds we can update uh, the eligibility requirements with our tool uh, that's available in the open source software. So what used to take months to update now can be done in, in seconds if we had the eligibility rules that we do need to update with. Um, so with that, I'll end my um, statement because I have 15 seconds here, but thank you. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, um, Chairperson Levin, members of the, oh. Okay. So good afternoon, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today on the proposed legislation 855. I'm Andre Manier, I'm an assistant director at, at Family Health Centers for NYU Langone. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, for 50 years, the Family Health Center has been a staple in the Sunset Park, Southwest Brooklyn communities. Through the years, we have grown from one health center to nine primary care locations, providing medical, dental, and behavioral care, um, over 30 school-based um, health centers and dental clinics, 
um, a community medicine program that serves over 7,000 homeless New Yorkers within shelters, and a myriad of social support services catering to the needs of over 100,000 health center patients. Um, working at the Family Health Centers for over five years and living within its service areas, I have seen the tremendous impact that the health center has had on the most vulnerable populations, the children, the homeless, the poor, the unemployed. Last year, approximately 80% of our patient population was 200% below the federal poverty level. 70% were 100% and below. Though providing the best care to these patients is our mission, we know it's not enough. The Family Health Center's outreach and enrollment team ha may successfully enroll patients in Medicaid, but it doesn't address the needs um, that affect them and their families, particularly amongst the homeless population. Barriers like unstable housing, food security, unemployment, or low paying jobs and low educational attainment all play a significant impact to our patients' uh, access to care and engagement in their own health. Going to the doctor is simply not a priority when a patient is in an unstable environment and not paying attention to one's health can lead to unnecessary hospitalization, severe illnesses, chronic disease, all of which we know commonly affect the poor and low income. Many local, state, and federal government assistance programs offer the opportunity to tackle these barriers. Many of them have been created to help people get on their feet, to forge a stable environment for my fellow New Yorkers. But unfortunately, people of the communities we serve often know very little about these programs as navigating through the system is somewhat difficult and many re rely on word of mouth. And to find out whether or not they are even eligible is another mystery amongst our patients. The Family Health Center supports this legis legislation today because it ensures people will be notified of their eligibility requirements and it will provide the basic necessity of transparency with government programs. Good afternoon, I'm John Robertson from Columbia University School of Social Work. And I was invited here by um, Councilmember Kalos today. I want to start by commending the council for taking this direction. For two generations, um, public uh, benefits in America have been based on fraud prevention instead of eligibility and getting uh, people uh, assuring the benefits people need. We have a democratic process that decides what benefits people have a right to, and then we figure out ways to keep people from accessing them. And uh, so the steps that would cause HRA and the city to become proactive in delivering benefits to clients rather than to restrict benefits are very important. I've worked for over 35 years in Bushwick and Ocean Hill with many different kinds of folks. I, these, lately I've been working with frail elderly people who get very complicated forms from Medicaid and from food stamps and from HEAP and uh, from housing renewal voucher pieces with people who have limited sight, who have limited cognitive ability, and are, they're expected to continue to refill out these forms without annual renewal, a simple unified annual renewal. Um, so I, I think that moving towards some kind of centralized and organized renewal and eligibility process would be vital. I think it's going to cost uh, the city in uh, staff development. Um, we at the moment have eligibility workers who's, who on the whole don't un only understand in the most limited way what eligibility is and have to go to supervision for almost any question beyond that. And so for people to understand eligibility for HEAP and for food stamps and for Medicaid and for uh, housing programs and for WIC and for TANF is gonna require uh, investment in the eligibility workers that work for city agencies. Finally, I'd like to say that um, this, this initiative needs to include NYCHA and um, ACS and HHC and the Department of Corrections, all of whom play a role in giving people access to benefits. Thanks. Thank you for uh, tremendous uh, testimony. 
uh, with regards to uh, the uh, the work of uh, GovLab in terms uh, what why is GovLab specifically interested in this how can we use data to have better governance and uh, why can some states do it but New York can't <laughs> I would say there's no reason that New York can't do it. Uh, in fact, to the contrary, um, th there is every reason that New York, as other states have done, should be in the business of using the data that it already collects from the forms people fill out that are already stored in databases in the city to use that, obviously, to pre-fill forms, to make to pre-fill renewal applications, and eventually, I hope, and where this legislation uh, uh, should be going, is in the direction of making the delivery of benefits through the kind of means testing that, it, in, that uh, software like Intuit has developed make possible, uh, the ability to then deliver benefits automatically where they are owing to people so that they never have to go through the described process of filling out forms, uh, especially not lengthy and complicated forms. It should be something that we can take care of for people. And the reason to do that is not simply to enable the delivery of benefits and decrease the stigma of doing so, but to decrease cost, administrative burden for the city. So GovLab is interested not only because we care about the social justice issues at the root of this question, but because we care about how government uses data and technology to, in fact, streamline the delivery of services to people. And in terms of your, your you as a resource and GovLab as a resource isn't limited to just me as a council member, or if, if the uh, Commissioner of uh, Department of Social Services called you tomorrow, would a, a GovLab be available? Council member, I hate to disappoint you, but uh, you're not that special. We are very happy to be helpful to anybody who needs. GovLab is both a think tank and a do tank. We work directly with public institutions at every level of government, helping people to develop the ideas and to develop the practice of using technology in new ways. So it's an area where we at GovLab, which is part of NYU, um, like our colleagues at Columbia, I'm sure are very happy uh, um, to be of use here uh, and to provide whatever uh, assistance that we can in helping to identify the practicalities of how to implement this in practice. Because I think that's the big mystery here that a lot of people have, that it could be difficult to do. The answer is it's not. It is very doable even with legacy systems. So happy to take that offline and talk about the details of the implementation. Perfect. Thank you. I'd like to excuse you, excuse you if you wish. I, so my uh, question first to our, uh, our uh, guest from Intuit. Uh, which office are you working out of and, and how far did you travel for this hearing? Uh, <clears throat> I'm currently out of the, uh, actually our uh, headquarters in Mountain View, California. And so came from uh, San Francisco last night and I'm leaving shortly after this meeting. So. Well, thank you very <laughs> much for uh, coming all this way. Uh, why, so, so how did, you, how did Intuit even come to Benefit Assist, and uh, how many folks did we end up finding who didn't already have benefits? Great question. Um, so uh, our founder of Intuit, uh, Scott Cook, actually uh, has been his uh, key piece where over 30 years he's wanted to develop a system where it truly just gives back to our customers. Um, and to that commitment, part of it was how can we help the customers that need it the most using our TurboTax software. And so to, you know, not only for customers using our software, but we also did BenefitAssist.com. So you didn't even need to be a TurboTax or Intuit customer to be able to use our benefits, uh, Benefit Assist engine. Um, <clears throat> your second question, um, <clears throat> the, uh, it's approximately a little over, <clears throat> excuse me, approximately a little over a million people in 2015 that we found benefits for and helped facilitate the um, um, filling out the application and sending it to the appropriate agency across all 50 states. Now, <clears throat> we were limited in our ability to be able to understand what happens after the application comes back, um, which was our ongoing work to partner with government agencies to close that gap and to better um, build our software. And so uh, the commissioner, we, we, the commissioner and I went back and forth. So you've developed your own rules engine based on reading the, their, <laughs> their paper rules, their regulations they, they write in legalese. Uh, if tomorrow the Department of Social Services in the city of New York made their rules engine available, would there be any difference between how their system processed applications and rules uh, from how yours would if you were using the same rules? 
So um, if I understand your question correctly, um, the short answer would be there should be no difference. And part of that is we took the rules that were all publicly available to us, um, meaning um, we, we took every application uh, from the state and also the federal level and made sure to incorporate as much as we could to our knowledge uh, into the system. Um, so to answer your question, yes, it should be a one-to-one -one parallel with what's publicly available to us. And so... Uh, how many hours or what would you be estimate your uh, the number of hours that w Intuit invested into benefit assist? Oh, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tens of thousands of hours, um, I would say, because of the amount of teams. Um, we had an entire team that went through every single application across all 50 states and contacted every single um, local agency available for, um, for benefits to make sure all the information we had in our system um, was compiled across all 50 states. Um, so it was a very large effort on, on Intuit's part. Uh, I, I never asked this question. I'm sorry, I'm curious. Which took more time, the code or the <laughs> discerning the regulations? The regulations was actually the, the, the eight months of work. The actual code only took us about two months uh, total, once we understood what we and needed. And how many developers did you have working on it? Uh, three. So, uh, and, and so if New York City wanted uh, to do that, would we have to pay into it for it to t take your software and your intellectual property? Um, no, we've open sourced it, so it's 100% free uh, to use. Um, and we've also into it has stated that um, publicly that we'd be more than happy to assist um, in the integration of that system. So, to so tomorrow, if if Department of Social, so y it's available. I've downloaded. I've looked at it. Uh, if tomorrow Department of Social Services for the city or New York State or another jurisdiction on in the city state or, or in another country said, we want to use this, uh, I'm the only one who gets it, right? <laughs> no, it, it's, it is free and open to anyone that um, we want to encourage anybody that wants to use it to use it. Um, and um, that is something we definitely didn't want to have behind closed doors that into it. We wanted to gift it to anyone that wants to use the engine uh, for these benefits. Do you, do you recall the URL to if somebody wants to download it because they're watching it at home or if they want to test it out? I, I, unfortunately, I don't have it with me but um, off the top of my head, but I, I can send the, the, uh, the repository link. Uh, so uh, I, I, I believe it's on a GitHub repository hosted by the federal government at the uh, Medicaid, uh, by, by the offices, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, as part of a larger conglomerate group of software. Uh, and so uh, I think Last but just uh, certainly not least, I just want to want to thank you for making the code available to everyone and encourage other folks to deal with it. I want to move on to the the and just thank you for your collaboration. Uh, I think one of the concerns I had when we started was could we build an infrastructure that could pr process this many benefits? And the answer is not only yes, but now the code is free for anyone to change. It's I I looked at it the. Code is more elegant than perhaps, I, I thought it was more beautiful than the Grand Canyon. Uh, I, I, I did not cry when I saw the Grand Canyon, I cried when I saw their code. Uh, f I want to thank uh, NYU Langone for testifying. Uh, help me understand this, so in your testimony, Moni, you are saying that medical care just isn't enough and that people actually have other problems that affect their health? <laughs> it's not affecting their health, but their, I mean, it. It, honestly, it does. If you don't have a stable place to live, then your priority is actually not coming to the doctor. It's securing your housing. It's having, if you don't have a place for your daughter to go to daycare, um, then your priority is being home with your daughter as opposed to going to the doctor. It just presents itself as barriers. Not that they don't know that they might have a health issue that they need to take care of, but it's, you know, do they have the opportunity to do so? If, in terms of, uh, I, I'm a big advocate on, on food and health, mm -hmm. uh, is there any link that NYU has found or that you're studying or can, interested in studying between uh, the impacts of having access to food and SNAP and whether or not folks are able to make healthy choices in terms of eating? Because you've got a thousand calories here but it's it's got high fat high sodium and it's in a can but there's 200 calories over there but it's healthy calories that might be more um, I mean we do you know health education to all of our patients and we counsel them on nutrition as well um, sometimes making that choice isn't as easy as that some some of our patients lack the knowledge 
Um, we, you know, we serve uh, an area of many immigrants. Uh, we have, you know, Chinese, um, uh, Spanish, uh, you know, Arabic um, population. They all, they're more culturally in tune as opposed to, you know, what is the correct way to eat healthy. Um, so, you know, try telling a Chinese person not to eat white rice and have them, you know, eat brown rice instead. Sometimes it's it's very difficult to make that that uh, that change in their behaviors because cultural norms are more valuable to our patients as opposed to you know what's right to eat and what's not. Um, we are studying our population um, in different aspects. We are working with um, the School of Population Health to do some studies on how we can help them. But it, you know, we do have these. Um, things that hold us back. If this legislation were passed, would that allow you to offer people additional benefits beyond Medicaid uh, through your services? Yes, so um, it would allow our patients to, uh, yes, it would. It would link, um, especially our homeless population. We have outreach and enrollers that go there to help enroll them in Medicaid, um, but they, you know, they're very, they don't know um, you know, what else they're eligible for. They don't know the opportunities that they have. Um, this would allow them to, to be knowledgeable of what, what is out there for them, what they can take advantage of, what they qualify for, wh whether or not they're eligible. And not just for the homeless, for a lot of our low-income population as well. Um, they are not aware, you know, they, you know, they only know what they hear at, you know, their community centers, they only know what they hear from their friends, their neighbors, um, and they are not reaping the benefits that they can. And, and so, uh, I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Robertson for, for being here and testifying and actually putting a point on it about fraud prevention. Uh, so is, are, do you have any concerns that if we actually had everyone's information and we use their tax information or their benefits information that perhaps uh, somebody who is very low income but it wasn't, was perhaps at 201 percent of the poverty line instead of 200 percent might be getting it and doesn't that ju keeping that one person from having their benefits uh, when they shouldn't because they're one percent over the poverty line, doesn't that justify stopping 600,000 New Yorkers from not having staff? Council Member, I think that when you have 28 different systems with all kinds of different paperwork and many, many different approaches, what you do is give the hustler the opportunity and people who are looking to game the system game it. I think that by rationalizing it and pulling it together, you actually uh, have a much more honest conversation with the people that are applying. and um, and. The, I teach this all the time. If we keep food stamp fraud down to one and a half percent where it is right now, we're doing better than any other fraud organization in the country. Um, so every time there's money around, there are people to hustle the system. The question is, does it, is it improved by creating all of these very ob obscure and difficult processes that make no sense? But while I have the mic, there's something I would like to pitch about, and that is that uh, when you're doing electronic uh, accessing with clients that are not electronically capable, we really need fingerprint passports. Because if I'm a social worker working with someone and I have to open the account, um, whether it's with Medicare or Social Security or with New York City, I'm sitting with someone and we need to create a password that is unique to them and that they have control over. And so I would like to push, since the people I'm talking to right here, I'm talking to, uh, getting some password, uh, fingerprint passwording for this stuff. So first, thank you for answering the question. Second, uh, just for anyone who is watching who may not know me, my, my question was actually, I was taking the devil's advocate position. I don't I actually that, agree with yes. that, what I had said. Uh, I'll, I will just, with, I, I know that there are some concerns in the privacy community about using fingerprints as passwords and then what can be done with that information. And there's also new uh, technology where folks take pictures and then pull the fingerprints off people. That's fine. But I will just simplify it and ask our resident tech expert uh, from Intuit, uh, just in his expert capacity as a technologist, uh, whether or not it would be possible to uh, build accounts around a uh, fingerprint that could actually be swiped on a phone 
like so. Um, yeah, the, the actual technology to actually uh, swipe it, if um, you could, um, but then implementing that in ways where a user could then um, identify themselves outside the phone, I think would be a little more difficult. Um, but from a technology uh, standpoint, yeah, you could. Okay. Uh, and so I guess, so y your argument is just the fraud for, for Snap is so low uh, that it should not be a concern. And uh, I guess the other question no, is... No, my argument is yeah. that uh, we create benefits we democratically create benefits that people should access. And to be obsessed about only fraud rather than delivering benefits is to, is to redirect the purpose of the, of the democracy, um, which there's been a fairly large push in some parts on the right to simply redirect the uh, place of our benefits. And I think we've seen that in, in some of the appointments in New York City social services over the last 50, 20 years. And so I'm really glad to see an effort that is returning benefits to being actually providing what the, what the country has decided people should have. Uh, I just want to thank all the panelists for being here in person. I, I know there was an option to submit testimony, but I just appreciate your being here in person to make the case yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. And I think longest longest trip ever, maybe, for somebody testifying. I don't know if that's an official record, but you may have it for this year, at least. Joel Berg, Hunger Free America. Yvonne Pena, Community Service Society. Emily Moran, Single Stop. And Matt Bishop, Open City Labs. I'm, I'm ready. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Joel Berg, uh, CEO of Hunger Free America. I look forward to the New York Post headline tomorrow, Liberal Council Chair Condemns uh, Bushwick Hipster Funky People. Uh, <laughs> and I want to more seriously thank you for you and Councilman Kalos for all your leadership on getting more funding for hunger programs in, in uh, the budget. I don't have a lot to say about homelessness. I mostly want to praise Councilman Kalos's uh, bill. But I, I do want to say the federal government, the state government, the city government, and the real estate industry all have to be held accountable for our homelessness crisis. But so does every New Yorker who's ever opposed a homeless shelter, uh, affordable housing unit, or supportive housing coming into their neighborhood, particularly my progressive friends who claim to be so anti-Trump and pro-refugee they should put up or shut up. Anyway, on to the Councilman Kalos's uh, bill. Uh, it's, he's absolutely right. We've been working on this together for years. I actually have a chapter in my new book on this very topic. Uh, the idea of uh, making it easier for low-income people to access government uh, services. Economists often talk about opportunity co points, well, opportunity costs when it comes to wealthy people, but don't respect the time of low-income people. And the truth of the matter is this society is losing billions and billions and billions of dollars a year because low-income people are waiting online uh, at social services offices instead of working or taking care of their kids or studying, etc. Just to get uh, uber wonkish for just a second is I think it's important to distinguish what the city can do on its own versus what we need the state and the federal government to do. Right now, under federal law, you have to have a separate interview just for SNAP food stamps. Uh, the city doesn't even manage WIC clinics. That's managed by private entities on behalf of the state. To file for your income taxes, you have to go through the federal IRS. You can't go through a city agency. So that's one reason we're working with members of Congress, and we'd love your support of this, to get authorization perhaps in the next farm bill for a pilot project that actually makes it easier for the city to do this. And certainly the commissioner's right. This has to go through a state system, So, uh, and by federal law, it's really the states who are empowered to run many of these programs due to the wishes of seg Southern segregationists who basically won't in the House and Senate uh, years ago who wanted to be able to ban certain people getting these benefits. But at the city level, you're absolutely right. There are a thousand things the city can be or should be doing on its own. But I respectfully suggest the biggest problem isn't the committee, the agencies under this jurisdiction, this committee. It's the other city agencies work working with HRA to do this and really having a, a seamless system. Other states do it. There's no reason we shouldn't do it. And I just want to push back a little against the suggestion of fingerprinting. We just want a multi-decade battle to stop the process of criminalizing this. I understand people weren't suggesting that we criminalize it, using it for a different way, but the message would be criminalization. We just get Arizona to end uh, finger imaging for SNAP, for goodness sakes. 
Let's not bring it back here. Thank you. Hi, uh, Chair Levin and Council Member Kalis. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Emily Morano. I'm Single Steps Manager of Policy and Research, um, and I'm here representing our organization. Um, we connect New Yorkers with the full spectrum of benefits and resources available to them, and the premise behind Single Stop has always been based on multiple benefit access, um, because access to individually a single benefit may not be able to stabilize a household, but in concert, multiple resources can address the underlying causes of poverty. So I'm here to enthusiastically support this bill and all, all efforts by the city to further the goal of making the safety net more accessible. Um, we need, in order for New Yorkers to attain household stability, they need to, and benefit from the proven long-term outcomes of the safety net programs, they have to first learn about the existence of the programs and then navigate the complex application processes. So we need to make that easier. Um, we've been at the forefront of working to make coordinated access to the social safety net simpler for people who need it um, for a long time. We convened a national coalition that did work highlighting reforms to modernize application procedures for benefits. Um, we've in-house created a web-based app that allows clients to find programs that they're eligible for. Um, and we're currently one of the lead partners on the Robin Hood Start by Asking campaign here in New York City to access multiple benefits. Uh, based on our experiences, we believe that this proposed legislation is a big step towards the goal of increasing access to programs designed to help provide help to low-income New, York New Yorkers. We know it will be a big task for HRA to su successfully implement uh, the law so that families receive easy to understand and actionable information, but once done, it's going to be highly valuable to the families who receive the resources they need to stabilize their lives. Uh, in other jurisdictions, the, the lessons of program integration have been to, that, su <laughs> that sustainable change requires collaboration and redesign business processes that support the goal. Policy alignment must be a priority, and HRA and its partners must be intentional about the implementation of policy, refining their approach as they go. Single Stop here, uh, is here to offer HRA and the City Council our support, our partnership, and our knowledge from our more than 10 years of experience with connected clients to multiple benefits as you go forward with this challenge. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the great, great work that Single Stop does. We greatly appreciate it. Hi, good afternoon, Chairperson Levin. My name is Yvonne Pena, Project Director for the Community Service Society Benefits Plus Learning Center. I would like to thank Council Member Kalos for the invitation and thank you all for the opportunity to provide testimony on the process of applying for assistance along with intro 855A in relation to notification of public assistance eligibility. CSS is a 176-year-old organization whose mission is to promote policies and create programs that advance the economic security of low- and moderate-income New Yorkers. We have the expertise in helping low-income New Yorkers access public benefits, including Medicaid, SNAP, Cash Assistance, Scree and Dree, and many others through two programs, the Benefits Plus Learning Center and the Advocacy, Counseling, and Entitlement Services Program, or ACES. The Benefits Plus Learning Center was created to address the problem that we all know exists. Too often, New York City residents encounter a myriad of difficulties in accessing public benefits. The system can be difficult to navigate, and social service professionals who work with New York City's vulnerable population cannot always keep up with rules and regulations that constantly change. Accredited by the New York State Education Department, the Learning Center provides intensive trainings on the New York City public benefit system for staff of social service organizations to serve their clients more effectively. The center also publishes an online manual, Benefits Plus, with comprehensive information on more than 80 different government benefit and housing programs. We also have extensive experience in directly helping low-income New Yorkers obtain the public benefits for which they qualify. Established in 1984, the ACES program excuse me, trains volunteers ages 55 and over to serve as public benefit counselors in community agencies throughout New York City. Last year, ACES volunteers assisted 5,700 clients with 7,800 public benefit issues. CSS supports the city's first step toward reimagining how government administers public assistance program through the proposed intro 855A. Because most low-income households qualify for a range of different public benefit programs, creating technology to facilitate the application process 
and eligibility verification for needs-based benefits would be both cost-effective and efficient. This technology would avoid duplication of efforts and save time for both the consumer and the government and entities that administer these programs. And promoting access to the full package of benefits for which families qualify, Intro 855A will help families meet their need for food, medical care, affordable housing, and child care. For this reason, CSS supports Intro 855A, provisions for providing automatic, automatic notices, and applicants of one public assistance program when they are likely to qualify for additional programs administered by HRA. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Bishop. I'm CEO of Open City Labs. Um, I want to thank uh, Council Member Ben Kalos for his leadership. Uh, on the automatic benefits legislation and many other uh, technology related initiatives. Um, and I'm here to ask the City Council and HRA to support this critical legislation because everyone deserves quick and efficient access to government services and benefits. As you know, as you all know well, quality programs are only as effective as they are accessible. Uh, nationally, $80 billion uh, in government benefits goes unclaimed by people who are eligible every year. And the downstream effects of this are that are increased hunger, poor health, and a missed opportunity to help people reach their potential. I want to recognize the leadership of Mayor de Blasio, the Commissioner, Matt Klein, and Ariel Kennan. Uh, making city services more accessible has been a major focus of this administration, and programs like Access NYC have received national attention. This legislation builds on existing initiatives and raises the bar even higher. Streamlining access is a critical next step in addressing inequality in New York City. My experience working at Volunteers of America, a nonprofit that contracts with HRA and tw over 20 other agencies to provide social services, has showed me that these government benefits can be a lifeline, yet the process of applying for these benefits is both both tedious and clients often have to repeat the process as they move from agency to agency. In addition, the burden on clients to the burden on clients, the burden on staff is enormous. I founded Open City Labs to make it easy to apply for government programs. As a technology entrepreneur, I know that applying for government programs and services can be almost as easy as ordering lunch on Seamless. Um, Technology can make the implementation of this legislation not just possible, uh, but it can also reduce the paperwork for case managers. Every moment of unnecessary paperwork that we can save HRA employees and case managers uh, is a moment of opportunity. These are the moments of human connection between case manager and client um, that are opportunities for self-discovery and self-healing that empower clients to take the next t steps to self-sufficiency. Thank you. Thank you very much to this panel. Um, I'm going to, unfortunately, I have to, to leave, but I'm going to turn it over to, and leave in the capable hands of Councilmember Kalos to, to close out the hearing. There are two more panels uh, after this panel. I will, um, I assure you, because uh, everything is online, I will be watching your testimony um, uh, for the next two panels uh, tomorrow when I come into the office. Um, but I greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate all the work that you've all done. Um, and, uh, and I thank you very much for your patience in being here, and I, I, uh, again, I greatly appreciate uh, your testimony. So, I'm so I apologize, but I'm, I'm unfortunately um, do it another appointment. So, thank you. Uh, a quick question for Community Service Society. So, you have a Benefits Plus system. I'm curious whether or not you built that in-house or if you're using uh, Aunt Bertha or another product similarly for single stop for, for both of you, how are you screening people and uh, how would this legislation change the work that you do and how much of it is spent doing paperwork versus actually just helping people manage their lives? Sure. So uh, the first program, the Benefits Plus Learning Center, is actually not a uh, system that you can input information and gather data on a client to figure out if they're eligible. Instead, it's actually an online manual and, and we provide training services to agencies who want to know better how to navigate 
the public benefit system so that in turn they can better help their clients. We do actually have a what we call a SNAP calculator, and that calculator is free. It's available to everybody um, in New York in, and in New York State. People can put in information and find out one if they're potentially eligible for SNAP benefits and about how much they would be eligible to receive. Um, our current volunteers they do an intake with each client. So the ACES program, those that's the program that actually helps clients access benefits, they do an intake, they find out specific information for each client, such as household ties, income, and they try to do their best to navigate across all programs so they could streamline for the client a way to know which benefits they could be eligible for. A program like this would help us immensely because it would allow us access to applications, to different programs, without having to go here, and then here, and then here. Um, so this, this technology, if it, if it does come to fruition, would be great, would be a great addition. Um, yeah, our technology has a screening component. It screens uh, for five programs, well, five if you count health insurance as one right now, um, in uh, nine states, including New York. Um, so the, the, system itself does the full rules and engine that the government also does once they submit the application. Um, the dream would be that clients could just enter their information once somewhere and then that information is captured and provided to whoever needs it to provide them the, with the program that they need. Um, I think that this legislation is a good first step towards clients um, understanding what they are eligible for and looking at the forms and seeing what they want to do. Um, they, they'll probably still need guidance as a caseworker in a lot of cases, um, but anything that can help make the process smoother I think is important. And if I could just interject here, uh, one thing that CSS does is we are also navigators. Uh, so we help New Yorkers enroll in healthcare. So we envision this system being like the marketplace and although we do know that the, it would be, it's, it's a tall order, but we do want to pose it to the council to partner with state and federal government to make something like this so that it streamlines, streamlines benefits across all different areas, so not just local, but right. state and federal. Yeah. I like your idea so much. We suggested to the federal government that for the 17 states that didn't have marketplaces where the federal government had created it using healthcare.gov, Right. that they uh, build that in. Uh, and actually, I will give that letter to uh, Secretary, uh, sorry, not Secretary, to Zions, uh, to uh, our committee council for the record. Uh, and so we, we have a, a technologist here who has started a company. Does the technology that they're, that everyone's asking for, uh, we, we've had Intuit who's built a product. Uh, you, do you have a similar product that could handle this situation too? And so, and, and how hard is sure. this technology to to build if we would just make the rules public? O Open City Labs is focused on um, the process of populating the forms with the information needed. So the um, client information can be entered by a social worker once. Um, they select the programs that they're interested in. A, applying for on behalf of their client and then the that that those PDFs would be populated and uh, auto faxed to the agencies in question um, we're also looking at kind of like a telehealth component where um, social workers and navigators could uh, connect with um, people via text message and guide them through the applications and our software would pull the data and into the forms um, through kind of like a conversational form. Um. So, uh, Joel, you have. So, uh, Joel, uh, you have extensive testimony that has multiple pages with some. I want to keep my eight. former employer, the Forest Service, in business. Fair, fair <laughs> enough, but with in, in terms of just, uh, you, you touch on a lot of issues. Uh, so, you. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, reduction of bureaucracy, and is that perhaps one of the reasons that we see uh, what people would generally classify as red states 
as leaders in this, uh, Louisiana, South Carolina, it's, it's hard to say that this state isn't as progressive as they are when it comes to, uh, so, so, take, so, so why are they ahead of us and is, is that actually something they're seeing? Well, you know, technology, as you know, is neutral value neutral and some states have used uh, technology for evil purposes some have used it for evil and mixed good purposes and some have used it for good purposes there are some states that their main purpose in reducing bureaucracy has to been you know reduce the the state workforce and basically crush public employees uh, unions in some cases their goals of reducing bureaucracy coincide with the goals of progressives of increasing access to public benefits and in some places they've had on paper what looks like access but really oh we're going to let you call in but the call centers never answer but new york city and new york state is is uh you know way behind and you know hra has made some significant progress but again there are challenges and i'd say the technology is the least of the problems in some sense for instance there has never been a uniform protocol on what constitutes an electronic signature Virtually all of these applications require that you sign your attesting to the truth on, on pain of perjury. And I don't think there's, a, there's a, an agreed upon set of protocols at the state, federal, and city level of what constitutes an electronic signature. In a sensible world, you would have one electronic signature that you check at the bottom that everything I've said for all these programs is accurate and that one signature uh, is good to go. But I don't think that's the case now under federal, state, or city law. And that'd be great progress. And, you know, we're talking a lot about what the people have to provide and the financial information, but also other information. To me, it is insane that it is incumbent on the citizens or the residents to submit government documents to the government. A and, you know, the place you're going to live changes, uh, your income changes, the place you are born uh, unless you believe in reincarnation, never changes. Uh, and so the fact that every time you have to resubmit an application every year, every six months, you have to reprove where you're born, you as a citizen provide a government document to the government seems insane. It should seem that there should be a, 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 a protocol with good safety protocols and, pers uh, and privacy protocols that to protect that information that the government should serve. okay, you were born here, we've asked once, we never have to ask again. What was your question? <laughs> Politicians uh, aren't the only ones who can pivot. It's <laughs> fine. Uh, and so, so we were, in your testimony, you mentioned the fact that it reduces bureaucracy, which is why some conservative states have implemented it. Uh, you also put up the, sh the additional argument uh, that some might argue creates more reliance on big government and uh, such that people would never – We'll, we'll just continue to rely. But what say you to that? Even though that's a load go of go online and, and, and watch. That's a load of hypocritical bull. You know, one of the most prominent uh, proponents of, of that line of reasoning is a Speaker of the House who's been on a government payroll nearly his entire life, who after his <laughs> His uh, father died. He received SSI survivor's benefits, arguably welfare benefits. And let's be clear, the American right isn't against big government. They're against big government for people who don't vote for them or don't give them campaign contributions. When it comes to corporate welfare... Tell us what you really think. Yeah, when it comes to, when it comes to corporate welfare for massive agriculture concerns run by huge corporations, they're all for ever bigger checks. When it comes to defense contractors, building products we don't need for wars we shouldn't be fighting, they're all for it. Uh, when it comes to tax breaks for their buddies for their second home, they're all for it. So this argument that they're against big government is ridiculous. There's not an iota of evidence that programs like SNAP increase dependency. Uh, Ninety percent. 90% of the parents with children in the SNAP program were working the year before and the year after getting SNAP. 83% of the people in the SNAP program are children, people with disabilities, or senior citizens. The arguments from the right are just a lot of crock. The SNAP program supports work. Now, low-income people like me, they think the best answer to poverty should be a living wage job. But as long as our economy fails to do that, and as many of the opponents of SNAP fail to support higher wages, it's entirely hypocritical for them to oppose allowing... Uh, to basically 
call for allowing people to starve, which also goes against their professed Christianity, I must add. You, you right. mentioned a hope account. What is a hope account? The idea is, is taking on what you've proposed and even going the next step of allowing every single program to be combined into one program, accessed by a smartphone. You'd be able to access your EITC benefits, your SNAP benefits, all your social service benefits. Not only apply for them by a smartphone, but manage your benefits by a smartphone. If there are any government savings programs like an individual development account, you'd be able to manage them uh, there. Now, there are some say, well, this putting them all in one place would make it the easier for the right to cut them all. That's ridiculous. The right doesn't need our help to propose massive cuts in social service programs. I say to my uh, progressive friends, that's like two people on a, a firing squad saying, do you want to ask for a cigarette? And the other goes, no, I don't want to make them mad. You know, the president has proposed bigger cuts in the social service safety net than even proposed by Ronald Reagan, $192 billion in cuts to social service safety net. So the idea that we shouldn't propose progressive reforms because we're worried about them being hijacked by the other side is preposterous. And I do note, I call very specifically, if this does reduce the jobs in the social service bureaucracy filling out forms, I support every one of those single jobs being maintained, being maintained as a unionized job, but instead of filling out meaningless jobs, forms that can help people access housing. They can staff a universal pre-K center. They can staff a, 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 a job training center. We don't need to have low-income people, the only people in America, unaffected by the technology revolution of the last few decades. Th thank you very much. Uh, I urge folks to read the testimony online and uh, excuse this panel. Thank you for your thank patience. You. Uh, and our next panel, Alexandra Brandis from Lenox Hill Neighborhood House, which is a settlement house in my district. I want to thank them for joining us through a very long day. Uh, and uh, thank you for also offering some assistance. Uh, Lenox Hill Neighborhood House actually has a women's shelter that they run on Park Avenue uh, at the uh, Armory, uh, which we try to do what we can in my district. We also have Olivia uh, from New York City Veterans Alliance, Elena. Alana Duffy from Pathfinder Labs and New York City Veterans Alliance. And again, thank you for your patience on what is a long hearing. And then we'll have one more panel. Uh, for the folks who just finished testifying, hopefully you can hear me. But if you can hand over your testimony, we would love to enter it into the record. I'll ask the sergeant at arms after they're done distributing to see if we can pick up the testimony from those who just testified. Uh, if anyone here is still waiting to testify, please make sure to fill out one of the witness slips. Please begin. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos, for the opportunity to testify about proposed legislation 855A. My name is Alexandra Brandes. I'm the supervising attorney of the Healthcare Access Project at Lenox Hill Neighborhood House. As Councilmember Kalos pointed out, Lenox Hill Neighborhood House is a settlement house on the east side of Manhattan that has provided integrated social services to low income New Yorkers for 123 years. When clients contact our legal advocacy department for assistance, they are screened for public benefits. Frequently, clients are receiving none or only one of several public benefits to which they are entitled. For instance, a senior contacted our office for assistance because he could not afford to buy his asthma medications. This resulted in hospitalization and severe health complications. Although the client received the maximum SNAP benefit, he did not know he qualified for the Medicare Savings Program, Extra Help, Epic, or SCRI. Had he been informed of his eligibility for these programs when he first received his SNAP benefits, he might never have been hospitalized or had irreparable health damage. This, this client represents what many New York City seniors and other people face as um, a quarter of seniors over, a quarter of New York City residents over 65 live below poverty and are often forced to choose between buying necessary medical care and food. Lenox Hill Neighborhood House fully supports the proposal to expand notice of eligibility. We would like to highlight several areas where legislative intervention is still needed. First, the statutory notification requirement should expand beyond current benefit recipients to include individuals who are potentially and or prospectively eligible. Second, the department should be obligated to reduce lapses in public benefits assistance via automatic recertification, expanded grace periods, and retroactive reinstatement for good cause. Third, the department should be required to include in its report the estimated number of eligible people for each public benefit in addition to the target number of people enrolled. 
These proposals will improve the lives of those adversely affected by these, the existing statutory scheme. We appreciate the Council's investigation and are hopeful that the concerns described in the, in the written testimony submitted today will be addressed. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. I can. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you to Chairman Levin and, and committee members for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Olivia Meyer, and I am here to offer testimony on intro 855A on behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance, a member supported grassroots policy advocacy and empowerment organization serving veterans, service members, and their families across the New York City metropolitan area. We applaud and support Council Member. Councilmember Kalis' bill to improve and streamline access to public assistance for our fellow New Yorkers in need. New York City is a leader in digital innovation in the private sector, and we must marshal the latest advances in technology, not just for corporate profit, but for the, good so for the social good of improving the lives of the most vulnerable among us. It should be as easy to find information and apply for services with city agencies as it is to apply for a job or place an order online to have sushi delivered. It shouldn't be an exhausting, confusing, frustrating process for a citizen in need to determine their eligibility for food or housing assistance or to initiate their application. Our fellow New Yorkers who are, in, who are in need or in crisis should have streamlined, compassionate access to the help they need, not a series of frustrating barriers that are too often, that too often conceal or limit access to crucial resources for which they are eligible. My organization has advocated for improved access to resources for veterans of the United States Armed Forces and currently serving members of Reserve, National Guard, and State Militia Forces. Over the years, there have been frustrating barriers for these individuals, an estimated, estimated at 220,000 across the five boroughs, plus an, an estimated 250,000 family members, being able to access the city, state, and federal benefits and services for which they or their families are eligible. Taken together, approximately 1 in 17 New Yorkers are eligible to, for city, state, and federal benefits and services for, provided for veterans and their families. Yet far too many veterans, even those most in need, do not identify as veterans because they served during peacetime or they were never called to active status. When those who have served in the military and their families do not self-identify as veterans and seek out the benefits and services to which they are eligible, this represents potentially millions of federal and state dollars that are not reaching families and communities here in New York City that need that money. As such, to ensure that streamlined access to services for the 1 in 17 New Yorkers who who have either served in the military or who are a spouse or a dependent family member of someone who served, we strongly urge this committee to amend the current bill to include the specification that applicants requesting assistance from HRA be, sque be screened for prior service in the U.S. Armed Forces or State Guard or Militia or for whether their spouse or head of household has ever served in the U.S. Armed Forces or State Guard or Militia. On behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance, I thank you for the opportunity. Uh, council members, please first allow me to first to thank you for proposing and supporting this initiative and for hearing the testimony of the efficacy of this proposed program. My name is Alana Duffy and I am the founder and CEO of the support and civil services technology platform Pathfinder Labs. We provide a very similar service to the one proposed, linking our current test group of veterans and their families to vetted community resources to support their reintegration process. We are also close to enabling universal registration features and direct referral services, as well as push notifications for eligible individuals. A significant number of the capabilities you are requesting in your initiative are al already or soon to be features on our platform, so I'm here to speak to some of our market research that ensures your goal is attainable. The primary issue facing registration and referral of underserved populations is that is each organization has different technological capabilities and each individual has different needs and meets different criteria to be eligible for services as well established today. It is a fairly complex task, per particularly when some of the organizations are still using paper filing systems. How at least my company is solving this issue for the underserved is taking following steps for services. Providing a, a standardized information providing standardized information on each service listed, focusing in particular on limitations, restrictions, and other eligibility concerns. For example, since we are starting with a veteran population, we're able to sort requirements like or requirements and conditions like discharge status or service era. This ensures connecting the individual with the service for which they are immediately qualified. Income, family status, other criteria could easily be integrated for general population needs and city services. 
We also categorize these services based on what they provide. In homelessness, for example, there are resources for at-risk populations as well as currently homeless populations, and these can be important distinctions for rapid response. We maintain the database of organizations connecting the organization to ensure correctness and completeness only once. By storing this information in our database, we're not only able to have a consistently updated list of services provided, but can provide analysis on requests based on location, populations, numbers served, and so forth. This is one of the advantages of having a centrally maintained third-party system, as in your case, it can be also be compared to non-city options for each service provided. This ultimately helps with planning of social services and an accurate assessment of needs met and needs outstanding in a population in which it is often difficult to obtain data. And the rest is all in my written testimony, which you have a copy of. And thank you for hearing my testimony on this initiative. Thank you very much. So, uh, so you feel that uh, the city could easily build the uh, technology infrastructure we need to administer these programs? Build, maybe not. Uh, it's taken us a little bit to, uh, to hammer out some of this, mm -hmm. but I believe that the implementation of it is, um, is acceptable and the technology exists and it's out there to yeah. be able to implement. And forgive me for y me asking you versus probably four or five of the previous panelists who are working at solving the same problem. Uh, you support this even though we might actually end up being a competitor who ends up building this and making the rules engine out there for you to use. That's Yeah, it's no problem. Uh, we're, we're working with uh, actually New York State already and the city of Boston. And we're international or not international or interstate at this at this point. So and uh, are you I, I see you sitting next to other folks are, who, who I know are at Civic Hall Labs, sorry, Civic Hall, are you also at Civic Hall? I am also at Civic Hall. Perfect. So uh, you, you are with the right folks, and Civic Hall has some of the best projects. Uh, so one of the questions that we have is, uh, so this is going to be the place where we dive right into way too much data, uh, at least with uh, these two panelists. Uh, you mentioned that you we should try to figure, you said, quote, HRA should uh, should screen for prior service in the U.S. Armed Forces or State Guard or militia and for whether their spouse or head of household has ever served in the U.S. Armed Forces, State Guard, or militia. Uh, one of the questions we have as we're drafting uh, is where is that data set, who owns it, how private is it, and can private sector or the government or, or the city government gain access to that easily or does the city already have that list? Uh, I don't know. You know? If I, I don't Which know. The city has a list. Um, DBS would probably be the best people to ask about that particular question about about who. So like so the yes, the, the the plan and clear question is: Does yes. the city of New York or the state or federal government have a list of armed forces uh, or state guard or militia that is in some way publicly accessible or government accessible? It is, uh, there is a list that is government accessible mm -hmm. uh, that the, uh, the only problem is is that the military frequently does not track veterans as after they leave the service. They don't necessarily know if they move, if they relocate. Uh, the best accessible form would actually be the uh, Department of Veteran Affairs uh, and they would be able to cooperate with the city on identifying those who are at least using those services. Unfortunately, that does, uh, that only it will encompass about 50% of the population. I remember from 10 or so years ago while I was a practicing <laughs> attorney that when we sued somebody, you have to prove that the person isn't on active duty. And I remember there was a service we paid that we would give them the name and yeah. then they would give us back that the, do you, do you what, what uh, that, that actually, you don't, uh, you, the service itself, you don't necessarily have to use anymore. Uh, there are records checks that can be done through the federal government with, uh, through actually Fort Knox is still currently keeping the records. Um, and <laughs> oddly enough, uh, for, uh, so uh, Fort Knox, they were gonna move it over to Fort Leavenworth. I doubt they ever did. Um, it was the military, they don't move things. Uh, but they can actually Look, they can do the research to determine if somebody is still on active duty or ever did serve on active duty. So I guess uh, my, my promise to you is if you 
to can work with me to identify where the city could gain access to that data. Uh, I, I would work with our committee council to determine whether or not that would be something fair to ask HRA. And so uh, to, to uh, our attorney from Lenox Hill, first, thank you for the great work that you do. Thank you for offering uh, somebody who testified before you some assistance, even if they might be outside your encatchment area. It, I appreciate the great work that you do. Uh, thank you for coming with specific suggestions on ways to improve the legislation. Uh, in terms of initially this was based on tax data uh, and so the idea was anyone who had a 1099 uh, we could just use that data. Uh, so your first suggestion is how to, how to identify people who are prospectively eligible and so the same question applies of just is there a specific data set you might suggest or is there information that DSS or another city agency might already have uh, that we could refer to for identifying that? Um, my <clears throat> suggestion was based off of knowing that, the, um, that New York State pulls that information for Medicaid for the state of New York and so um, and for other assistance um, for health insurance purposes. So at least for Medicaid and HRA um, and other medical assistance program benefits, it seems that they could use the same source um, since those are governed by the same federal and state um, regulations. And then in terms of my suggestion for people who are potentially or prospectively eligible, part of that was that benefits um, eligibility can change based on how old you are um, and so you know, if somebody applies at 59 and are, they're turned away, but at 60 they may be eligible if nothing else changes, that might be helpful to know um, because some benefits do vary depending on how old you are. And so I think that's something that could be really useful to know that, oh, you're not eligible now, but maybe in six months right. with this income you would be because yeah. when you're 60 things are a little different. And so that was that also that suggestion is that Okay, you know, so a lot of times when people are just denied, they don't really know exactly what the reason is, and it doesn't mean that they're never going to be eligible again, but a lot of times people feel like that's a barrier. I appreciate the hearing process, so you are correct. Uh, a denial is a data point, and a denial is not permanent in time. It, 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 I think a lot of us think as a denial as, like, that's – when you think technology-wise, that's that's a balance. That's no longer a customer. But to then see that data point as this person is not valid now as a applicant, but they might be in a year, two years. So I think uh, what we, I, I like the idea, and I will we will see about amending in terms of saying that we should keep the information to use that for future benefits because also the SCREA and DREA law changed. Exactly. And we changed it from 25 to 50, so if somebody applied and was denied, we could send them the uh, an update being like, hey, two years ago you had this income, you didn't qualify, but we changed it. I exactly. thank you. Okay, that is helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, automatic recertification, if there's any jurisdictions that currently do so. Uh, I did not come across it in my research in 2015, if you have it. I can look into it and let you know. Yes. Uh, the 90-day grace period for recertification, uh, again, if there is an existing waiver that another state has, uh, and we believe we can get it from this administration, uh, I, the good cause, uh, so is there currently a practice where HRA allows for uh, reinstatement of lapse benefits or retroactive? I, so I, I like the idea. Let's work a little bit more together, and we can figure yeah. out whether or not um, it is within I the. I don't know. Yes, for SNAP and public assistance, I believe um, they currently do allow good cause as a reason for retroactive reinstatement. But it's not currently part of Medicaid or the Medicare Savings Program. I've had several clients who were hospitalized um, for a period of time, then in rehab, and so then let's, they let's had a lapse, and it was a pain to reinstate. Let's figure out why why that is and where that is as that sure. gets and were there any other suggestions that you had made because they were all, all this is you are an amazing panel I appreciate it 
Um, I believe they are all in the written. Um, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I've addressed them so I could think them out with you. Yeah. I'm a uh, brainstormer. And anyone watching, you can go to ben Sorry, I blew through them because um, I knew ben I only Kalos had two minutes and I was trying to respect everyone's time. That's so. fine. Um, yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, I think the biggest things we see are related to, you know, the people that are um, maybe denied for one benefit and not told that they could qualify for something else because every benefit is a little bit different. Yeah. So it's incredibly confusing. And then, you know, when people get on a benefit, you know, finding out that, um, like not getting kicked off for an arbitrary reason um, would be helpful. And I think just for, for this panel, to the extent you've connected with individuals who have had situations where, but for, I think it would be helpful to have specific anecdotal cases of people where they thought, like the person who just walked out, who, who had testified, who said like, they told me I didn't get anything because I, I already have SSDI. I think the more stories and people who are willing to go on record to say like, if only I had gotten the additional benefits, I wouldn't have ended up here. So uh, I want to thank you uh, very much. And I'll excuse you and thank you for sticking around for a, a five hour <laughs> hearing, which